Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Wheeler Centre, where I'm really delighted to be in conversation with Rachel Kushner. So, Rachel Kushner was, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, the, or at least a, literary sensation of the US last year with her second novel, The Flamethrowers, which was hailed as brilliant by everyone from Jonathan Franzen, who called her a thrilling and prodigious novelist, to Colm Toibin. The book was a finalist for the 2013 National Book Award and a New York Times bestseller and top 10 book of 2013. Rachel's debut novel, Telex from Cuba, which I'll just pause and heartily recommend. Uh, it will be for sale along with this one. Uh, was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award and a New York Times bestseller. Rachel is the only writer ever to be nominated for a National Book Award in fiction for both a first and a second novel. Her fiction and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Paris Review, The Believer, Art Forum, Bomb and more. She's the recipient of a 2013 Guggenheim Fellowship. So for those of you who haven't read it, I will give you a brief introduction to the world of the flamethrowers now, and then we'll dive in. Set between the art world of 1970s New York, motorcycle racing in the Nevada desert, Italy during the wars and in the 70s, and the jungles of Brazil, the Flamethrowers follows the twin trage trajectories of an attractive young unnamed narrator nicknamed Reno for her hometown and Italy's Valera family, creators of a tyre and motorcycle dynasty whose privilege is built on exploitation and violence as well as a canny pragmatism. Reno moves to New York after art school where she's chosen as the girlfriend of handsome celebrity artist Sandro Valera son of the senior Valera, who we watch build his empire through a series of flashbacks. Reno embarks on her own art project to race a motorcycle in the desert and photograph her tracks. This novel takes, us, uh, takes as its many subjects gender politics, performing the self, the blur between art and life, war and violence, labour and privilege, and love and friendship in the age of irony and much more besides. Um, before I launch into uh, our conversation, um, please join me in welcoming Rachel to the stage. Uh, I'm going to start with a question about your narrator, um, your central narrator, I should say, who's nicknamed but never named. Um, her day job is as a China girl, uh, an anonymous girl whose image appears in film reels at such a speed that she's never seen. Um, in a novel of, full of obsessive talkers, she's a listener. And I wondered what inspired you to create this narrator who's so fixedly kind of in the background of her own life and whether you think there's a value in being a listener in a world of talkers. Sure. Thanks, Jo. Um, thanks for that introduction. I can only let you down. <laughs> and thanks, no. everyone, for coming. This is a great crowd. Um, I was in Adelaide before I came here, so I've been consistently 30 minutes late to everything I was meant to do here today. So I'm marveling that I got here on time. Um, yeah, the narrator, she's never named in the book. And I think it's just one or maybe two times, very briefly, another character condescendingly calls her Reno because she's from Reno, Nevada, which is a kind of small town podunk place in the West, which people from New York City would consider to be not New York City. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, when the book came out, people started calling her Reno because it's very hard to talk about a book without knowing the name uh, of the main character. But not, not naming her was somehow sort of essential for me because she, I wanted her to be a character who expresses herself in a way that felt to me like thought rather than like a spoken, performed self, mm. which is oftentimes when you read a novel that's written in the first person, it's very voicey, and the person is kind of performing the voice to make it fun, and um, I wanted it to be fun, but in a different way. And so when I, when I constructed her character, as I went along with her, um, I felt that she 
was perceiving those things around her and trying to interpret them in a way that felt lifelike to me. So it wasn't that I decided to put her in the background. I just decided that she would be young and would be someone who was drawn to try to understand worlds that are a little more sophisticated than she is. And the way to understand a lot of times, at least with the milieu that I was writing about, which was the art world in New York City, is not to ask a lot of questions because that makes it seem as if you don't know what you're talking about or shouldn't maybe be included. And so maybe I was just drawing on what I felt to be true about being young, which is that when you want to kind of be taken up by people who are a little more sophisticated than you are, you listen to the way that they speak and what they speak about. And when you're ready to intervene on their level, that's when you do and not before. Hmm. That may, and, and the idea of the China girl, that, that job that she has that kind of complements that that ro- how did that come oh yeah about? I forgot Maybe that, that was the essential <laughs> part of the question thank you yeah she works um, is a, a very real thing up through the 1970s all over the world actually uh, I, I think they started in the 20s this phenomenon called the China girl which is um, it was usually women who worked like in the film processing labs at Kodak uh, or other processing labs and they were usually secretaries in the labs who would pose uh, holding a color bar, you know, like the, the Kodak color chart, or they would put a color bar below the photograph of the woman. And the purpose of these women were to provide a skin tone, I should say a white skin tone. I mean, the, the entire way that film is processed, it is keyed and dialed toward white skin. It's really, I mean, when you want to look into the structure <laughs> of the way that skin color affects how we look at things it's astounding but um these women were their faces were meant to provide a kind of constant or ledger so that um films could be processed to look consistent you know when you're watching a film and you see a face that's not in the right tone it's very obvious but you wouldn't notice that the curtains were in the wrong tone you would just assume they look like what you're looking at but faces you know you can't fake the color of skin Uh, So these women were put on film reels and their face appears on the leader of the film, which is a very, like the the first part of the reel. And if it's loaded correctly by a projectionist in the old days when we watched real films, uh, not digital, um, if it was loaded correctly, you never saw that woman. It's only if it's incorrectly loaded would you see her picture. And so these, there were, you know, not that many China girls. Um, some of them, their faces appear over and over and ag- again on different films, distributed all over the world. And so they're sort of pervasive and ever-present on the film reel, but you never see their face. And when you do, they flash by so fast that it's almost like you didn't see them. And um, I became interested in them and started looking them up, not for the book, just out of a you know natural interest. And I read that the, there were people who worked in film labs who started to collect... Um, little clipped pieces of film that had these China girls on them and they would trade them in the film labs like (laughs) baseball cards and they're women who are sort of like they're disappeared ephemeral women you know there's no name attached to them and they don't look like models they just look like regular women which makes them even more mysterious because you see them and assume they have a life whereas when you're walking Uh, down the street and see, you know, an ad for cosmetics or something, and there's a giant picture of a woman up there, you don't think about her interior life because she's made to be looked at. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's, it's a fascinating idea. I wonder if there's so many little interesting little details in the book. Were you kind of, did you find that as you were writing that you were sort of collecting things to to put in there or like little, little observations like that that you found or, or did they, those things just work their way into the book? Well, I mean, if this makes sense as an answer, I feel like um, I live in a way that my experience of the world is filtered by the book I'm writing. Mm. Um, I know it to be the case because I'm writing my third novel now, which is, you know, it's not that many books, but it's enough to get a feeling that there's a a way that I do things. And um, my experience of the world is that I'm I look for things that interest me, and they only interest me insofar as they either pertain to my novel or they don't. (laughs) Um, And so, and my second book was, in a way, it's very different than my first book because it was like, I wanted to 
activate and put into play all these different aspects of my sensibility because I discovered that that was fun for me to do. <laughs> um, so it wasn't like I was collecting things for the book. I was collecting things as a modality of being because it's the only way I know really how to live. And I will instinctually take note of something and decide that it's possible it might be incorporated, not because it's neato or cool, but because it might relate to the rest of the book. And so I just wait to see if it does. Um, but I try not to put anything in merely because it is interesting or quirky, because then you just you end up with a kind of mud pie. Like you have a lot of quirky things together put into a book. Um, but for me, they have to start to sing together. There has to be some logic, but not a really overdetermined logic either. It's one of those things that's like slightly hard to explain. It's no, no, that's a great... I, I, so it's that those details have to make sense with the world of the book. They come out of the world of the book and how they fit rather than you like the details, so you're yeah, going to try and work it in but there. But not too much sense. <laughs> oh, you, your ways of working have to remain a little bit mysterious, surely. So, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you... The, the Flamethrowers is set in part in the art scene of 70s New York, um, and I, I love some of the ideas in there about that scene, like the, the questions of the lines between art and life and performance and authenticity and where art gets its value from, um, like why why we value art and and one thing I found really interesting was the idea um, that seemed a very contemporary one to me that the story around the artist is often more or as integral to the success to success as the art itself um, for instance your character Ronnie who um, even his best friend likes his stories more than his art I just wondered if you could right. talk a bit about those ideas in in the novel sure yeah um, yeah there's a character in the novel for those who haven't read it called Ronnie Fontaine and his best friend, Sandro, I mean, to me, they have that kind of typical male relationship where they greatly admire each other and are never not in competition. Mm. Um, but Sandro says at one point that Ronnie's best piece uh, is something that Ronnie said, which was that he wanted to photograph every living person. And, you know, so it's just the kind of poetic gambit slash impossibility of obviously doing that. I took that um, from a real from a real life comment that uh, uh, the late artist Douglas Hubler said. And I just thought it was so beautiful and absurd. Um, you know, I want to photograph every living person. But also it seemed to me indicative of something I've been known to be true about artists or have experienced being around them, um, which is that for some artists, they're never not being an artist. And some of them have this magnificent charisma. I've known artists um, who are like Douglas Hubler. I never got to meet him. He's a Los Angeles artist, which is where I live, but he died a long time ago. Um, and there are these other artists from that era that I've read about. There's a guy named Jack Goldstein, um, who was a very important artist who influenced a lot of other artists in the 1970s, like Cindy Sherman and Richard Prince. And um, Goldstein, he killed himself about 10 years ago. Um, and he had kind of fallen out of favor at the end of his life um, and w was a drug addict and living on sort of on the skids in Los Angeles. But a book came out about him and all these artists told stories about Jack Goldstein and the things that he would say and, you know... Uh, like he, at the end of his life, um, he was driving an ice cream truck and selling ice cream. And um, he was also had a heroin habit, or he was trying to get off heroin and he was going to methadone clinics. And he left his ice cream truck outside of a methadone clinic and the line t was so long to get his methadone that the ice cream all melted. <laughs> and um, he refroze it and sold it anyway. <laughs> And somehow, like, those little details, like, that, to me, are part of what makes Jack Goldstein so interesting. And, like, there's an artist named Larry Poons, uh, who, important painter in the 1960s in New York City. And I once met someone who'd been good friends with Larry Poons, and this woman said to me, oh, yeah, Larry Poons, you know, he didn't have anything. And after he got his first show, they gave him a big check. He went right down to Canal Street, bought 200 pairs of Levi's, 500 t-shirts and said I'm never doing laundry again and like so 
<laughs> I just was constantly hearing stories and meeting these artists and they want to perform themselves for you and so in a way the book is in part an homage to those personalities that's great so that detail about the um the never doing laundry again yeah i took the, that it's yeah <laughs> i recognize that that's great um i wonder if now you might um give us a little reading from the book oh sure i'd be happy to can everyone hear well in the way way back <clears throat> so uh this is from early on in the book, and the narrator has just arrived in New York City, uh, where she knows no one, and she has been wandering around, just kind of killing time um, and feeling very isolated. And she meets these two people in a bar, um, kind of dissolute-seeming people, a man named Thurman and a woman named Nadine, and is in conversation with them. Three or four drinks in, still, they hadn't asked me anything. But what interesting thing did I have to tell? I was content to listen to their stream of half reports on people I'd never heard of, stories I could not follow, one about a baby named Koch. This lady was nursing him, Nadine said, and then another lady, and you begin to think, wait a minute, whose baby is Koch? I don't know who was his mother and who was a wet nurse. I'll make you a wet nurse, Thurman said as he grabbed Nadine and put his hand between her legs. She twisted away and then she was prattling about a McDonald's she once went to in Mexico. I had been in a McDonald's commercial when I was in high school and I thought as Nadine spoke that it might be a story I could share with them. McDonald's is supposed to be the same everywhere, right? Well, not in Mexico. They Mexicanize it. Hamburguesa con chile, no fries, frijoles. I was with my ex. We were starving, and I was ready to eat beans. We're at the counter and find out we have no money. He'd lost his wallet. She went on about this ex, the revolution he had been fomenting that never took place and had led to their harsh and vagrant life in the mountains of northern Mexico, the hole in his pocket that his wallet wiggled through, leading to his inability to provide for her the most fundamental thing, a McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> that was how she put it, that he couldn't provide even a hamburger after which she left him and went to Hollywood, where the nightmare really began, a series of episodes and hard luck that involved rape, prostitution, and an addiction to Freon, the gas from the cooling element in refrigerators. What you get, Thurman said when she was finally finished, for marrying that motherfucker. I don't want to talk about him, and don't call him that, would you? You brought him up, only to tell her about the Mexican McDonald's. I was in a McDonald's commercial, I said. Oh, you're an actress. No, I just did the one thing. I was 16. It was just something an ad our coach answered, and Thurman, she's an actress. <laughs> well, I, we did act, I guess, but that's not... They needed a girl who could ski, and so I... You're an actress and a skier? <laughs> I never meet anyone who skis. Do you ski? I asked, only vaguely hopeful. Do I ski? No, honey. <laughs> <laughs> the commercial's director and crew had come to Mount Rose, where we trained. They talked to our coach and ended up choosing me and a racer named Lisa, a quiet girl no one really knew. There was a long day of takes and retakes. They wanted two girls with hair flying, snow bunnies on a brisk, sunny afternoon. A week later, they flew us both to Los Angeles, to a strange McDonald's in the city of industry where they only filmed commercials. It looked like a regular McDonald's with cashiers and paper hats, a menu board, the plastic bench tables where Lisa and I sat across from each other and smiled as if we were friends, although we weren't, 
each of us holding a hamburger in our fingers with hot lights on us, in this fake restaurant that looked real, except they didn't serve customers. I tried to explain this to Nadine, but she kept interrupting me. When we finished shooting the ad, I flew home to Reno. Lisa was supposed to be on the flight, but she wasn't. She was 18, an adult, and I didn't wonder. She had apparently gone to a bar near the fake McDonald's in the city of industry. No one ever heard from her again. Freaky, Nadine said. There's no telling. Once, I met the serial killer Ted Bundy. Can you believe it? He was real handsome, real smooth. I was on a beach, and here comes this hunky college guy. I was this close to ending up like that gal in the commercial with you. It hadn't occurred to me that Lisa had been murdered. I assumed she'd been impatient to meet her future and had just fled into it and never bothered to let anyone know where she was. I I miss Los Angeles, Nadine said. Don't you? I was only there for one night, I said, in the city of industry, which I don't think is actually Los Angeles. So the way the palm trees shake around, she went on, and it sounds like rain, but everything is sun reflected on metal. I once went to a house in the Hollywood Hills that was a glass dome on a pole, its elevator shaft. Belonged to a pervert bachelor, and he had peepholes everywhere. He was watching me in the toilet. Same guy drugged me without asking first. (laughs) Angel dust. I was on roller skates, which presented a whole extra challenge. (laughs) Thurman was laughing. I understood she was his airy nonsense maker, a bubble machine, and occasionally he would be in the mood for that. How the hell did you manage drugged on skates? He asked her. Like I said, there was an elevator. Anyhow, there's some use to being doped against your will. Before it happened, I didn't have my natural defenses. Some people don't get the whole boundaries thing until they've had their mind raped by another person. It helped me to establish some kind of minimum standard. She turned to me. Did you see Clute? Yeah, I said I did. I... I liked it, she said. (laughs) He didn't. She gestured at Thurman. She wasn't curious what I thought of Clute. But that very film had been on my mind, this portrait of a woman who was alone and isolated in the dense and crowded city. In my empty apartment, I'd been thinking of the scenes where her phone rings. She answers, and no one is there. I'll stop there. Thank you. That was a terrific. <laughs> I really hope that if there's an audio version of this book, you're reading it. <laughs> there is an audio version, but I didn't read it myself. I thought about doing it, but um, it takes like five 12-hour tw- days, I've heard, to do that. Fair so enough. someone else did it. <laughs> and um, there's a street in New York, Houston Street, kind of famous street, you know, and she pronounces it Houston Street all the way through the audio <laughs> version, unfortunately, but maybe they're going to correct it if anybody still wants to buy the auto, audio book. <laughs> I'm sure that won't put anyone off. <laughs> it's a good disclaimer. <laughs> Um, uh, One of the things I really love about your book is the stories within stories in it and and so many um, of the characters are are storytellers just as in that that excerpt that you wrote and also um, uh, Reno in particular is always, I'm going to call her Reno. Um, Go right ahead. (laughs) I've given in to that too. (laughs) Yeah. Um, that she's all that, that they reflect on um, on films or art that they've seen, and um, it, it makes a real pleasure to read. But it's also um, there are some great reflections on storytelling itself and its purposes, um, including the the way we hide behind language or use it to tell coded versions of the truth, um, or the way that we sometimes choose not to read what's really happening because we don't want to know the truth. So the stories that we tell about ourselves. Um, and I wondered what interested you about having all of those stories within the stories. I don't know. It's an addiction, I think. <laughs> uh, 
Now, I mean, there's different, you know, forming what a novel is and what its, what its motor is is such a process. Mm-hmm. Um, and with this book, I mean, I guess, you know, even just in, it, it, to try to testify to why I made this book about artists in the 70s, I started telling you guys stories about artists, you know, that I've encountered or stories I've heard about artists. And um, I just think it, this was the engine of the book in a way, was these stories and where are they going to go? And that was a question. They have to go somewhere. It can't just be story after story. But as I started to write, that was one of the energy sources uh, that I was working with, is that this woman is young and she's trying to navigate a world whose codes she hasn't really uh, learned to interpret quite yet. But I wanted her to be, you know, a kind of a sensitive camera to what's going on around her and a pair of ears, obviously. Um, and the more entertaining those people around her are, even if they're speaking in a way that she can't really interpret, she doesn't know if they're pulling her leg or not. But the more entertaining they were for me, the more fun, hopefully, it was going to be for the reader and the more compelling it would be for her to stick with it and stay among these people. Um, and, I, you know, I think I was, I was thinking about some kind of certain traditions in literature, like mm. Conrad often has a sort of framing mechanism. Um, and I just wonder about that, what the framing mechanism is, because it's something very traditional uh, in a 19th century novel when it's in the third person and there's one storyteller and then you're deep inside the story and you've forgotten all about the person who set it up you know, at the campfire, quote unquote, at the beginning. But in this case, it's a first person narrator. So she's always present for the stories that are told. And in a way, it was a formal challenge for me to have those stories going on in dialogue while she's just listening and being quiet and still finding a way to keep her there and keep her there for some kind of reason. Um, I think that stylistically I was influenced by the writer Roberto Bolaño. I mean, many writers have been. uh, He is an enormously unique writer. And there's a novel of his called Savage Detectives Mm -hmm. that I I was looking at very closely when I was working on this book. And our writing is completely different, and I would never claim to be influenced by him. I mean, I guess I just did right now, but I wouldn't wouldn't claim to uh, have created work um, that, you know, looks like I would have learned from him or that the influence is detectable in the work. Not at all. I mean, we're very different. But he does something in his writing where he lets people rise up off the page and speak and tell a story. And the story doesn't have to be calculated and controlled in a way that is going to further the plot of the book. It's just something that comes alive. And the characters that his narrator encounters in Mexico City, which is what the book is really about. It's about the poetry scene in Mexico City in the 70s. And part of what he wants you to understand is the nature of the people that made up that scene uh, and their idiosyncrasies. And I think I felt um, like I was given the green light by what I read in Bolaño's book to do my own version of that, which was instinctual for me. Like I was doing it, and then I read his book and saw that he was doing it and understood that it was a modern way of dealing with a long tradition of storytelling. Mm, great. Well, it, it works for It's so entertaining. And, and it gives you these great insights into some of those characters like Ronnie, for instance, who's just the ultimate storyteller, who are kind of creating themselves by telling these stories and also hiding parts of themselves when they tell these stories. Um, I, I found that really interesting. And that idea that uh, with, with Ronnie, for instance, and another character, Giddle, who's just a fantastic character. Um, uh, she's part of Warhol's um, uh, art scene and then goes and becomes a waitress for a year as a piece of performance art but then ends up a waitress um, <laughs> because it becomes authentic. People like that. I, I love those ideas of, of how what you tell can, can be actually become authentic in, in the telling and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if you had any ideas about what you were thinking when you wrote that. Well, several different things. I mean, the character Giddle, um, yeah, she's... As Joe said, she was someone who was part of 
you know, she's fictional. I'm talking about her like she's real. She was involved <laughs> with Andy Warhol's factory. Um, <laughs> I, I made her somebody who would have been involved in that world, partly because, you know, it's a, kind of a key site of art production in New York City in the 1960s, but also very powerfully kind of the most important social vacuum in a way. I mean, I think people got sucked into it or wanted to be. And then it was sort of this, you know, exclusive, um, you know, little matrix happening within the art world there. Um, and Warhol, he's a genius, but he's kind of a snob. And he's very drawn to wealthy women. A lot of the women who were part of the uh, Warhol scene and, you know, the factory girls um, were women who came from these, you know, classically blue blood families. Um, you know, Bridget Berlin's father was the president of the Hearst Corporation and they were all from high society. And so I had this idea that somebody who would have been part of that scene nominally but ultimately snubbed by it would be something interesting for me because the cruelty factor um, in socially exclusive circles just, you know, has to be dealt with somehow. But, um, and in terms of her becoming a waitress, I mean, I just have known so many people who, um, are bohemians in this way where they are concerned deeply and earnestly with being cool, yeah. so much so that they're not doing it for an audience anymore. Um, I had a roommate in New York City when I was young who'd gone to mortuary school on credit cards and then declared bankruptcy. And the whole thing was a performance. But she really was bankrupt. You know? <laughs> and once you've declared bankruptcy, you can't open a bank account. You have to pay cash for everything. Um, and she's not Giddle, but I've known many other people like her, and I wanted to create my own version of a person like that because there was something so courageous about her, I felt. I mean, she really had sacrificed her life to art, this woman. Um, and I once asked her, she, I knew her when she was in mortuary school, and she's doing the whole thing literally as an art project. She, wasn't, she was, actually did want to become a mortician, but that was part of the art project, too. Um, <laughs> But I, so I knew her when she was in mortuary school, and when she came home from her first uh, autopsy, she smelled horribly like formaldehyde and was very excited, and her eyes were glowing, and we were all kind of backing up and away from her. <laughs> and um, I said to this person, I shouldn't say her name, but I, she's actually the most ungoogleable person. I mean, that right there tells you someone is a real artist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we were backing away from the smell of formaldehyde and I said, what was it like witnessing an autopsy? And uh, this girl had a real thick southern accent. She's from Kentucky. She said, well, you know, Rachel, just picture like if, if my mind was a sweater. Um, <laughs> after the autopsy, I just ha I had like piles and piles of yarn but it was never going to be a sweater again. Oh! <laughs> that line made it into the book too, didn't it? Yeah, something I think like I that. did put something like that in there. Um, right. <laughs> but, I mean, there's just like millions of stories like that. Um, and so I was just thinking about people who commit themselves, but also I never realized this until I heard you succinctly uh, describing the waitress thing. I think it was me. I mean, I got a job as a waitress, and I just thought I was being very hip and ironic working at this terrible chain called the International House of Pancakes. Um, I hope. <laughs> uh, but after a while, work, you know, working there, just making ends meet was very hard. And when I was down on my hands and knees picking up pieces of soggy, maple syrup soggy pancake off the floor, and children were throwing more of them, and then people were, you know, putting their tip into the bottom of the milk glass to be funny it it wasn't really ironic anymore mm. yeah I, I love that idea you know where living life in quotes becomes just your life you know that's <laughs> great um, I'm going to kind of jump themes because um, I'm aware we're going to go to um, audience questions soon um, I wanted to talk about the hidden labor that's another um, theme of the book that um, 
labour that makes privilege possible. Um, there's the, the chauffeurs who wait all day outside Reno's apartment um, just in case their mafia employers want to be driven around. Um, the domestic staff in the Valera home in Milan, factory workers in Italy, um, the Indians who are tricked into labouring for free in the jungles of Brazil. Um, just that little list gives you an idea of how diverse the book is. Um, and I, what's, notice, what's notable um, is the indifference of the various employers to that labour, um, uh, I guess a, an acquired deliberate indifference, and that's something that, that the working class Reno is unable to affect. She notices these things. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit about that, that aspect of the book. Sure. I mean, I never really um, consciously thought of a list like that you know or that no but I, I mean it's good but it's I, I didn't intentionally think you know I'm working on a theme of hidden labor I, th I think it's just a way that I see things um, but I, you know I, I think that we're all sort of blinded even in our everyday lives to who is really making the world work mm. um, I mean you know now it's a particularly bizarre situation because all the manufacturing jobs are in China so we're so disconnected uh, from the people who are really making things with their hands mm. of course we have a service sector and you know people forget what that's like to work in the service sector but when I was writing the book I somehow wasn't as conscious of it I mean there there's a short scene that she's referring to in the book where there are uh, indigenous people in Brazil uh, working as rubber tappers and I had always known that there was going to be a passage like that in the book um, and I don't I don't know if I got the idea from this but I there was an article in the New York Times maybe 10 years ago, uh, about the legal case of these rubber workers in Brazil. And um, I, I may get some of the details incorrect. You know, I'm not a historian, but the, the basic story was this. These rubber workers were basically, they were conscripted uh, in World War II by the Brazilian government, who was working with the American government to produce rubber very quickly uh, as a munition for war because the United States was no longer able to access its own rubber um, plantations in Malaysia. So they worked with the Brazilian government and paid them very handsomely if the Brazilian government could harvest natural rubber. It was farmed rubber in Asia, but in Brazil they were harvesting natural rubber and they sent all these Indians um, into the f tropical rainforest of northeast Brazil to do this. And um, the legal case that was in the New York Times uh, was about them being paid. They were never paid, and not only that, they were never told that World War II was over. They were told that they were they were called rubber soldiers, and they were doing this, you know, as a kind of nationalist activity, a patriotic gesture, selflessness for the state. But they were also promised, you know, decent wages, and um, they worked there up into the 1970s. And their children and their grandchildren were also rubber workers. And they thought, in the future, there's going to be an enormous payout when we finally get this, you know, if not for myself, for my descendants, uh, literally. And um, I think at this point there, there has been a settlement, but it's hard to repay somebody uh, when they've sacrificed their life. It's very hard work. They're in this incredibly remote area. And um, the journalists asked uh, the lawyer who was representing the legal case where all the money went. And he said, how do you think they built Brasilia? And so I was just thinking about, you know, what we think of as this kind of sleek, modern Brazil, uh, you know, is very much symbolized in the architecture of Brasilia. And then I, uh, the contrast to that, or maybe the verso, you know, the underside of it, um, was these people working as rubber tappers. I can't believe that part of the book is real. Well, I guess I can, but yeah, that's amazing. Um... I'm just going to ask one more quick question and then I will throw it over to the audience. Um, I just... This novel's had a, a, a huge critical um, reaction and most of it wildly positive. Um, and amidst it all, there's been some discussion of you um, in the context of you being a female writer writing a book that's been described as a candidate for the mythical great American novel um, and that it's a book that takes in the world and politics as, as some of the subjects. And I thought Scandalous. it was... Scandalous. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I thought it was really interesting that given that you've explored female exceptionalism as a subject in the book, you know, characters are always talking about women are like this. Um, I wondered, is it strange then to be the subject of that kind of discussion yourself, um, of you as a woman writer rather than as a writer? Well, it's strange to be an author. It's, <laughs> you know, it's like it's natural to be a writer, but to be in public um, and to have an audience and to have a reception to your book, it's an incredible amount of luck to have readers. But um, I don't really follow the conversation of my own book. Um, I just don't think it's my work somehow. Like my work was writing the book. And then once the book is in the world, people are allowed to have any reaction to it that they want to. Mm -hmm. And I don't really get to have any rebuttal to their reaction. Um, I think my work is to keep moving and write a new book. So... (laughs) Thank you. <laughs> Great answer. I guess that if you get too caught up in the critical reaction, that might actually stop you from writing. You know what it is? I think that it's just, I mean, maybe everyone is like this. So sorry if this is banal, but I'm just always looking for signs and symbols of how to be, how to live my life. And um, looking up what people have written about my book or what they think about me as an author isn't going to give me any information about how to proceed. Um, for maybe that's just me. It just won't, and so it just doesn't. You know, I'm I'm grateful for the attention, but it's I don't feel like it's for me to read. Well, I see why you are currently at work on your next book as you um, are touring because you're able to <laughs> to pro, to ma- make that that um, to move on from from that reaction. I'm sure that that helps. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Please join thank me in you. thanking Rachel. Thank you, Joe. <laughs>